Yes, I'm Zach Oaks. Uh, talking about closure gains today. Thank you. This is my first conference I've ever been to. So I'm going to introduce myself here. I am an independent programmer in the Pittsburgh area. Uh, my, my past life, I did cryptography, steganography, that kind of stuff. So inevitably, after college, I uh, found myself in Maryland working for the federal government. And uh, two and a half years working with them is enough to uh, develop a moral conscience. <laughs> and so I quit. And that is when I started using Clojure. So these are my projects. Stuart was nice enough to mention them. Uh, I don't actually work on Nightweb anymore. Uh, you know, it, uh, it, I guess, ironically, is a tool to protect you from government spying. And uh, well, it, it kind of floundered. It didn't really do much. Uh, it didn't get a whole lot of usage. My fault. And I got really burnt out with crypto stuff. So I did something on a personal level that I think a lot of startups do when they fail. Does anybody know the word I'm thinking of? Say that again. Pivot. Exactly. I pivoted my life. <laughs> so, so I don't do crypto anymore. I haven't for like a year and a half now. I don't do that stuff anymore. Uh, my new hobby is teaching programming. And the best part about it is nothing to do with imparting knowledge or any of that other stuff. I don't care about any of that. What I care about is that it has nothing to do with cryptography. So. Uh, <laughs> So the, the three other projects you see here are just stuff I made for my students. So I made Nightcode. It's a IDE for beginners. Uh, not a whole lot to say about that. It's, you can use it if you want, whatever. Uh, I, I update it frequently for my users, all four of them. <laughs> or at least that's what the survey. Now, I don't actually think I have four users. I think I have more than four users. But the problem is that beginners do not fill out closure surveys. And so I am destined to be underrepresented in these numbers. I'm mostly mentioning this for the sake of Bojidar, because you need to understand that Colin is not the only one you should be worried about. <laughs> it, uh, I'm, I'm the dark horse of closure IDEs, the night horse, so to speak. So, yeah. Anyway, I use closure, uh, or sorry, I use night code to teach people closure in Pittsburgh. We call them Pittsburghers. And, uh, and some of them asked me to teach them game development, and there was no closure library at the time for that. So I made one. And uh, then I made night mod, which is a tool that uh, complements it, makes it easier for beginners. All right, so you're caught up uh, with the life of Zach. So now let's talk about games. I'm going to start with more of a meta discussion, what I think game development can do for closure, for the closure community, and then we'll get into the technical stuff. Uh, game development is a common way people get into programming. At least that's how I got into it. 12 years ago when I was 15, I learned C++. And one of the very first things I did was I made a game. And I'm curious how many people here started programming by making a game. One of the first things, not necessarily the first thing, but yeah, that's a good number. Uh, I don't know how many that is, but it's, it's a good number. Sorry to the people with the, watching the video. You can't see. Um, so yeah, I, th I think having a solid Game development story is just good for us. It gets a lot of newcomers into closure. And I think people from diverse backgrounds, too. I think uh, you know, it's, it's certainly true that everybody plays games. So theoretically, game development should be able to attract the same uh, you know, broad spectrum of humanity. This summer, I got the chance to, uh, to teach a closure game development class um, at my local library. And uh, so far, the theory holds. So we got a good turnout, got a variety of people. Most of them had zero 
programming experience at all, except the little one there. I, he was really smart. I don't know what's going on there. But uh, everyone else was, like, was completely new to programming. And, uh, and yeah, my friends Chad and Felicia helped me to organize it. And uh, we had a, had a lot of fun. It took place in Ambridge, by the way, which is a small town north of Pittsburgh. It's very blue collar. Uh, you know, lots of abandoned factories, and the uh, school system is actually pretty good, but they don't have any dedicated programming classes. So, Also, my neighbor has a mullet, which is something that still exists in western Pennsylvania. Uh, so so it, it's a great town, but the last place you'd expect a closure game development class to be held. So if you can get people to show up there, you can pretty much do it anywhere. So that's what game development can do for closure. But let's talk about what really matters here. What can closure do for game development? Uh, that's what the arrow means. I'm not trying to do any like cute Haskell joke there. I'm just <laughs> saying. Um, so we, I think uh, it's important to solve real problems. I think people too often do things purely out of novelty. You can find them all on Hacker News. Uh, but people who want to solve real problems, I think I'm in good company here because uh, closure programmers tend to be very practical. Um, and to me, the biggest problem in games as a gamer is AAA games seem to be very stale. They seem to be rehash after rehash, the same old stuff, the same uh, plot lines, tropes, and uh, mechanics. And, of course, with slightly more polygons each year. And if these are the sorts of games you want to make, there's not a whole bunch that I can offer you. I think that mainstream game development tools are perfect for solving the low-level problems that these sorts of games have. So, of course, what I'm interested in are indie games. I'm interested in uh, this, this relatively new category of games where uh, they have relatively simple graphics by necessity uh, due to uh, you know, their, their lack of resources. And uh, as a result of that, they differentiate in other ways, like gameplay and artistic merit, and that's why I love them so much. Here, you know, just obvious examples, Bray and Spelunky, you know, beautiful artistically, but what made them really unique was the gameplay. It was the time rewinding in the case of Braid and the, uh, the randomized level generation in Spelunky. So, I mean, these are practically classics at this point. And, you know, more recent examples, you can see the pixels are actually getting bigger now, not smaller. I mean, indie game developers are really embracing their limitations. They're embracing uh, just the, the limitations that they have and the retro aesthetic, and I really like that. And lastly, I, I, I do want to mention art games which are games that are designed specifically to have a, a deeper, more artistic message. Uh, the two on the left are from Jason Rohrer, one of my favorite indie game developers. And uh, he, he made Passage, the one on the top, and Gravitation below it. You can see his pixels are even bigger. And yet, if you play his games, you'll find they uh, touch on deeper themes than uh, most other games that are far more sophisticated. So uh, the one on the top, Passage, is about the passage of time, growing old and dying with your loved one. Gravitation is a game about managing work-life balance and the debilitating effects of depression. So very heavy topics for a game, I would say. And yet, he pulls it off really brilliantly using spatial metaphor. And, uh, and he actually argues that 2D is better than 3D for this because 2D is more abstract. Papers, Please came out last year. It became quite popular. I'm sure part of it was because of the NSA stuff. I think people were in the mood for a game about abusive authoritarian governments. And, uh, but, but actually, if you play it, you play the role of someone checking people's papers. You, you play the border guard. So it, in a way, forces you to uh, empathize with them. Not necessarily the system, but empathize with them on an individual level, and I think that's one of the points of art, to uh, change your perception of the world. And, you know, people who play it actually often point out that it's a boring game. And that, to me, is exciting that, you know, that people's 
taste for games is becoming more sophisticated. Not that there's anything wrong with a fun game. Of course, we want that. But imagine if uh, movies were only comedies. I mean, it's great that we're finally branching out. And that's an example of it. So what's my point? I can, I, I'm kind of rambling here. Um, I'm, this is a technical talk. I'm talking about tools, of course. But I'm talking about tools for these kinds of games, indie games. Again, I don't, we don't want, or I, I at least don't expect, Madden 2016 to be written in Closure, or Call of Duty uh, 9, whatever the hell they're at right now. They're not going to be written in Closure. Uh, it's indie games, really, where, where the potential is. And so there's three things that I think would benefit them a lot. Hosted languages, that, that's one thing that's already happening. They're already being written in hosted languages. The other two, not quite so common, uh, but I'll make the, the case for why uh, they should. So the first one, traditionally, these have been rejected by game developers. Of course, garbage collection is evil, but things have changed quite a bit. It's not uncommon at all to see indie games being written, stuff like C Sharp, and job. I go on Game Jolt all the time and I just download random stuff and it's often it's, it's just something like a jar file someone wrote and uh, and you know there are a lot of reasons for that but I think one of the primary reasons is because of frameworks like these. These are just amazing and uh, you can't really see Unity but yeah. Uh, these are amazing frameworks that are both hosted on garbage collected runtimes. Unity is on the CLR, the GDX is on the JVM. And they, it, it's no surprise at all why these are so popular with indies. I mean, they target everything. That's kind of important. You know, you need to get your game in as many hands as possible. They have wide breadth. And of course, as closure programmers, we are spoiled. We can use both of these. Uh, so uh, Alex, I think, mentioned Arcadia. It's a very impressive project, getting Closure CLR to work with Unity. And very, very much recommend you to check it out, especially if you want to do 3D stuff. Um, LibGDX and, and my stuff supports 3D, but it's like a lower level 3D API. I don't use it much. I'm afraid of the Z axis completely. I stick to 2D. So, uh, And of course, with, with LibGDX, you can use my library, PlaySealJ, or you can just uh, use Java Interop directly. Some people have told me that PlaySealJ is a little too uh, hand-holding, there's too much for you, and I totally accept that. I made it for my students, like I mentioned, so if you want more flexibility, just use Java Interop. So yeah, that's my point. It's good to be hosted. I think that the argument has been turned completely because of those frameworks. They're so useful. They, there's such a big advantage to, uh, to a developer, and when you're using a language that does not have access to them, you really feel their absence. You have to do all that plumbing yourself. I mean, parsing tiled maps, uh, maybe even physics, who knows? I mean, it depends on what you can find libraries for. So, so that's great. I get, uh, so I'm gonna briefly talk about PlaySealJ. I need to rush through this because uh, I may not finish in time. And I also didn't start any timer, so I'm not uh, sure uh, if I'll go over time. Now, so PlaySealJ, if you want to start it, you have to pull down the template, as you can see with this Linegan command. It creates three separate Linegan projects for you. Uh, the, the Android project you can build with LineDroid. It uses all of the stuff from Daniel Solano Gomez and Alexander Yakashev. So all of that work they did, I'm just piggybacking on it here to get PlaySealJ running on Android. And iOS uses uh, LineFruit. That's a plugin I wrote. Uh, partially because I just wanted to write a plugin with that name. I just think that's a good name for that. Um, all it does is hook you into RoboVM, which is a bytecode to uh, machine code translator. So um, it, it, can, it can then get a, a closure game running on iOS. Uh, I, I actually don't know if it works, though. It works in the simulator, but I have been told by people who actually have iOS devices that uh, it kind of doesn't. And I, I'm pretty sure I know why. So I bootstrap the game with a Java file, and then I just use reflection to load your game. And that works with RoboVM, but the problem is RoboVM, uh, because of reflection, it can't statically determine what classes your game is using. And so the only way to get it to work is to tell RoboVM to uh, link everything. 
And that means like 7,000 Java classes. So it's a very, creates a very large iOS executable that apparently is too large to run on modern devices. So if someone could help me with that, that'd be great. Um, and Android, I mean, th that one works, but the frame rates are not great right now. So again, I could always use help. That's why I call it experimental. I get away with that. Now, the, the web backend in libgdx is not supported because uh, it uses Google Web Toolkit, which is a uh, source code translator, so we can't use it. However, I, I'm hearing rumors uh, that, I don't know if I'm allowed to say it, but I'm hearing rumors that maybe they'll use TVM at some point or something like that, which is a bytecode to JavaScript translator. That would be, that would be great, because then we could get Play CLJ games running in a browser uh, you know, without any code changes. So that would be really awesome if anyone wants to do that. Uh, any youngins out there who want a project for Google Summer of Code, I'd be happy to pretend to mentor you for that. Um, uh, so, so you go into the desktop project. This is the Hello World Play CLJ game. All right, uh, that's the part that matters. Def screen, it's very blurry, sorry. Uh, Def screen is a macro that uh, d just lets you hook into various libgdx events. If you've ever done any closure Android development, it's quite similar to the def activity macro. It just you know, lets you pass in anonymous functions, hook them up to certain events, and they'll run. Uh, not a whole lot of complication. The only difference is, in this case, you'll notice these functions have the same two arguments. It's really important. Screen is a hash map. Entities is a vector, so these are just little bits of state you can just store stuff inside of. Screen is for storing things you only need one of, like a renderer. And entities, of course, is going to hold your entities. And you can see here, you, uh, you update the entities vector by just using the return value. So ball and player are just two entities I'm creating. I'm associating a position onto them. I'm returning it. And then after on show is run, the screen and entities will now contain those, those values that, it, uh, that I'm putting in there right now. And so the next time a screen function runs, screen and entities will have those new values. So I uh, hope that makes sense. If it doesn't, then uh, just think about it harder. So <laughs> transforming entities uh, is what you'll probably end up doing for the most part. On render is the function I mentioned before. That's the one that runs constantly, OK? That's your game loop. So if you just imagine that on show function ran, well, now screen and entities has those values in it. And so really, all I'm doing here is I'm just mapping over my entities with a pure function. Like, that's, that's my game. This, this part right here is my game. And then this is, the, the rest of it is just, you know, side affecting stuff you got to do, like play sounds, render. But the real heart of the game is just a pure function that I'm mapping over my entities with. And you'll see later why that's, well, you already know why that's useful, but uh, I'll try to explain that more later. What are entities? Here are a couple distracting examples for you. Uh, so the, the red square is a shape. Closure logo is a texture entity. And the, the fiery thing is a particle effect. And the particle effect, you, you can just create that in a particle effect editor quite easily and then just load it in. Although I didn't make that one. I stole it from the libgdx test suite. Um, and all of these are just records. Entities are records that implement the same entity protocol. So I can use that really fast type-based dispatch, sorry, to, uh, to figure out how to draw them, because they all need to be drawn differently, of course. All right? And so, yeah, and since they're records, you can just associate whatever you want onto them. You can just store information into your entities. That way, they all contain a Java object at the end of the day. They have to. LibGDX is doing all the heavy lifting here. So there's a Java object inside of the record. And if, if all you want to do is just change the position of an entity, you don't even need to worry about it. You just associate x and y like I did two slides ago, and it'll change the position for you. But at some point, you do need to do more than that. You do need to actually grab the underlying Java object and run methods on it. And you can very easily do that. You just uh, create, in this case, a texture. You, uh, you pull out the object. You can run methods on it. So you can do that, but it's quite ugly, I think. At least I think it is. So what I did was all of those entity constructors 
that I showed you before, they're actually macros. And after the required argument, you can pass in method invocations inside the same S expression. So the thing at the top produces the thing at the bottom. They're the exact same. It's just a more terse syntax. Uh, that's it. I mean, just, just meant to be a little bit nicer. Um, in this case, it's for when you're creating it. But for an existing entity, you can do the same thing with a macro version that has a bang on the end. So that's how you would do it for an existing entity. The thing at the top produces the thing at the bottom. So one possible complaint is that, well, now I have to look at the libgdx Java docs, find the method I want, and then convert it into your dumb little DSL with, you know, by just changing the syntax. And that can be quite annoying. So a couple months after I released, this was last winter. Those of you from the Northeast US remember the polar vortex that we went through last winter. And uh, it was just a small, short period of time where we just had wicked cold temperatures from Canada, I guess. And, um, and, it was, and I was in Ambridge, right? So minus eight out or something like that. I don't want to go outside. So I spent like two days straight indoors working on a custom documentation generator and also uh, wondering what happened in my life. <laughs> and in the end, what I came up with was a tool, OK, that parses the play CLJ code and parses the libgdx Java code and then does a lot of very terrifying things I don't really remember. And in the end, what it produces is this. It's kind of blurry, but the point is, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's HTML documentation, and it has everything you need inside of it. All the methods are in there. You don't, never need to look at a Java doc from libgdx again. So uh, yeah. I mentioned I taught a class, and uh, so, yeah, I did. In fact, I wasn't lying. <laughs> and so one of the things I wanted to do, I like, I like to do this with students, is make them modify an existing game. Uh, you know, it's nice to start a game from scratch, but I think that you can really uh, engage them more if you, you make them modify an existing game, because you know, they have something that already exists. So the first thing that I usually do is I'll make them start with a platformer template, which is built into Night Mod. It's this thing right here, OK? Just, it's just a bird, apparently. Or my, the barista at my local coffee shop said it's a penguin. I don't, I don't know. But um, so if, if you want to actually modify it, the very first thing I do with my students is I make them open up the REPL. I'm sure you all are aware of how great the REPL is as a teaching tool. And in, in Night Mod, it's this button here. It just brings up your REPL, OK? And I walk them through a bunch of basic stuff. You know, how do you add 1 plus 1? How do you define a symbol? How do you run a function? After, after a while, once we're, they were fairly comfortable with the language, I wanted to actually modify the game. This particular namespace just provides some convenience functions. Like, there's one called eBang you can use to modify entities. Uh, the first argument is a filter function. I'm just going to do identity. Uh, identity, because there's only one uh, entity here. We don't really need to filter. The second thing is a screen. Whatever screen the, um, the entity is inside of, you need to specify that. And then after that, you just give it key value pairs that you want to associate into the entity. So I think at, at first I just said, hey, let's make the guy really big. You know, so this makes a level really easy to complete. So let me restart that now. So you, you do stuff like that. And uh, after you do that for, for enough you know, times, they get really comfortable with the idea of you know, really modifying little bits and pieces of the game. Like we did other stuff. You know, how do we make them jump higher, stuff like that. Eventually, I want them to actually edit source code. In this case, it's the, uh, the grid button here. I have a lot of files in here because it has my whole presentation. But this is the one I care about. So uh, we, we just went through here and did the same thing. We just modified little bits of code until we could f 
we got uh, bored. So, for example, we wanted to make the bird fly because it's a bird, and right now it can't fly. And there's this thing right here, can jump, that prevents it from flying. So, you know, I just had the students replace the expression with true because it always can jump. And so now, of course, now he's a bird. Now he can fly. So we did stuff like that pretty much for two hours straight. And I could do more, but I really need to move on here. So functional programming and logic programming were the second thing I mentioned. And again, these are, these are paradigms that aren't very common in game development right now. They should be. For, I don't need to you know, belabor the point of functional programming. It's the same benefits as any other kinds of software. Parallelism matters of you know, simplifying state change. Things like time rewinding becomes so much easier. And even though the languages themselves aren't being used much, the idioms certainly are. Carmack has been talking about this for years. Entity component systems are becoming popular. So bits and pieces of ideas are, are, are entering into the brains of game developers. So we just need to convince them to stop fighting your language and use one where these things are common. Logic programming, I'm very new to this, I'll admit. But I, it deserves a slide. I think that uh, you know, this is something that's uh, very promising for game development. These are just two papers that I thought you should read that involve this. The first one I found on David Nolan's Twitter, actually. And uh, I, don't, I don't use Twitter, but I search it sometimes. And I just search for closure. And I came across this link. It's a paper. It uses Core Logic to uh, create more rich game dialogues. And it does that because you know I've been playing RPGs my whole life, Final Fantasy, Lunar, all that stuff. And uh, dialogues in games have not become really any different in, uh, in that span of time. It's, it's all linear dialogues, dialogue trees, et cetera. So the idea here is, well, maybe we shouldn't store these as strings. Maybe we should store dialogue as data structures that we can run through logic functions, make much richer dialogues as a result. The other one is about uh, randomized dungeons that you can generate. It doesn't use core out logic, but it's still cool, I guess. So speaking of dungeons, this is a, a game that is quite dark on the screen. Sorry about that. But it's, a, uh, it's an isometric style game. I wanted to make something that was like Diablo 2, because I always played that as a kid. And you can see I'm getting pretty bad frame rates on the bottom left there. That's because I'm running this on a netbook with a 1.1 gigahertz Celeron processor. And uh, that's the only like, decently portable computer I have. So we're going to work with this. The good news is that there are two cores, so I can demo parallelism uh, kind of. <laughs> like, like I can kind of do it, but it's not going to get a huge benefit. I'm not even going to try to pretend, because there's overhead involved in parallelism, as you know. But let's just, let's just do it. So remember I said mapping over your entities will appear a function. So this, this thing right here, that's the game. Like that's the majority of the game right there. So uh, of course, switching it to pmap uh, is one way to do that in parallel. You're just using a thread pool now. Uh, it's, now it has to restart, and it takes a while for the FPS to stabilize. But you should get a modest improvement on this little machine, which means a big improvement on your machines. Uh, so, yeah, it's still stabilizing, but you can see it's starting to top into the 40s. So you get some benefit, at least. Now, uh, the other thing I mentioned in the previous slide, or two slides ago, was time rewinding. I know that this is really cliche for game demos at conferences, but uh, it's a good demonstration of the value of immutable data because it makes it so much easier in this case. In Play CLJ, time rewinding is a built-in feature. So if you want to actually exploit it, you just have to create your timeline like this. In your, you have to insert it into the screen map, which I mentioned earlier. It's, a, it's just an empty vector. And what Play CLJ will do is it'll start storing references to your entities vector inside of there after every frame. So if you want to rewind, uh, all you need to do, that pmap thing we were talking about, Surround that with an if statement. And in this case, it's going to be if key pressed, colon r. That's, that just means r is going to be my rewind key. 
and then rewind, bang, screen one. That's just a convenience function that pulls out the entity's vector from one frame ago and returns it and also removes it from the timeline. And the only other thing I would probably do is change thread last to some thread last because, uh, uh, because when you rewind all the way, it'll return nil. And so you probably don't want it to keep doing that. And again, this is a slow computer, so it takes a while to actually restart the game. Uh, I even have a spinning hard drive. Some of you remember those. So did it restart? I think it did. So I'm going to go kill somebody. This is more like Diablo 1, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> it's very. OK. And now I'm rewinding. All right. So you see his health going back up. And his health going back up. All right. So that's time rewinding. So, and it's, it's not just rewinding the position. You know, it's re rewind the health. Any bit of state that you store immutably will be rewound. So uh, yeah, I don't know how you would do that with mutable entities. It doesn't make sense to my brain. So I'm, I'm going to try to zoom out here. OK, this is what the game looks like when I'm zooming out. And the only reason I want to do that is uh, just to show you how they're randomly placed. I'm using Cordell logic in a very naive way, I'll admit. Like I could probably just use conditional statements. But that would not be as cool. So. I'm using core.logic logic to determine which rooms are valid to place a given bad guy. All right, so this is this is it right here. I mean, it's basically just saying they can't start in the start room, they, and uh, only the werewolf can start in the end room. Which is, uh, I don't really see the werewolf. Where is he? There he is. He's at. He's he's like covered by the health bar now. But anyway, uh, so the point here is not to say like this is really sophisticated Cordell logic function. It's to say this is how easy it is to embed a logic function inside of a game. And this is a big strength of closure because, of course, it's just a library. So we're using the same language for logic programming and for the game itself. Uh, and so you know, it's a big advantage. And that's, so it's extremely easy to use it for practical things like that. All right? So I need to move on. I actually don't know how much time I have. So if someone wants to just signal me if like I'm running out soon because uh, this is the last part here. Uh, interactivity, it was the, the third thing that I mentioned. And you know, there's no way to demo this. This is what I've been doing the whole time. But um, to me, it's the most, this is the selling point. This is the thing you need to put in bold letters on the flyer that you hand out to your neighbors when you canvas your neighborhood <laughs> preaching about closure games. You need to tell them about this. And it's not hot swapping. Any, you can hot swap Java. Like, that's not interactivity. It's the REPL. If you don't have that, then you don't have interactivity, in, well, in my opinion. So uh, and, and it's particularly important for art. It's important for things like uh, uh, music or uh, graphic art. So I'm not an artist, but uh, Pittsburgh has great art, has a great art scene. You know, it's got a lot of hippies making music for free, and uh, random murals along the side of the road. Uh, the story behind that is funny, but I, I probably don't have enough time to tell it, so I'm just going to move on. Um, so games, I, I feel that games are an art form as well. This is a contentious point. People have disagreed. Roger Ebert, before his untimely death, claimed that uh, games cannot be art. And he made a really good argument, I think. But uh, I think it only really applies to games today. Most games today don't even attempt it. But I think as a medium, they're capable of it. And, and to the extent that they are art, it is even more important that you make them interactively, because this is how art is always made, that process of playful experimentation, uh, you know, improvising uh, as you go along. This is something other artists can do. And it's inherent in their medium. You know, when, when you're a musician, you didn't have to work to make a guitar that plays the sound as you play it. You know, But when it comes to programming, you actually do need to work pretty hard to get tools that allow you to do that. So I don't really think I have time to talk about Quest Quest. It's special to me, because this is the first um, 
play CLJ game that I ever came across in the wild. It, uh, I don't know, it's, it's, uh, so it's made by Mike Patella, um, and Stephen Fick, I think, made the, the artwork for it. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's not done yet, I'll say that, but it's already better than most AAA games I've played. <laughs> like, you've got, you got random red rectangles, but that's not necessarily a problem. I mean, <laughs> I don't think art has to make sense all the time. I think that if it did, you know, David Lynch wouldn't be a famous movie director. That's, and the only criticism I have is there's too many steps. That's just, yeah. But I, I actually really love unfinished games. I think they're really charming. And they're just like begging for you to mod them. And there's another red rectangle. I don't know what that was. And, but it really is, I don't, I don't know. The, the part that I like the best, all right, is that normal games, they always have this really cliche uh, way of doing things. Unfinished games tend to avoid a lot of common game tropes, like having an ending. <laughs> and, and I just think endings are always really lame. It's always positive. It's always you killed the bad guy, and everyone loves you. And you know, uh, you've, you've just, Aragorn is king, you know, that kind of thing. And unfinished games always have this subtle, nihilistic kind of uh, ending, you know, like just a cliff that you just fall off. <laughs> and then you just, you know, drift away listlessly into the deep beyond. <laughs> I just find that really beautiful. It's just so artistic. Anyway. Uh, this is a re review here. Um, so the three points here. Don't reinvent the wheel. Use new powerful abstractions. And interactive programming is important because games are an art form. Uh, and so if you would like to see these slides, they're on my GitHub. And you need to use Nightmod to, uh, to, to view them. And that's my email. I, like I said, I don't really do social networking, but you can, if, if anybody here still uses email, you can still contact me that way. That's all I got. Thank you very much.